Friends, very good to have you with us again. James, very nice to see you. Are you nice keeping well? I, I am, thank you, Ian. Very good to see you too. Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, now, James, we must at the beginning remind people the things they need to do uh, with the video. Yes, um, we'd love you to like the videos. That helps. Like um, yep. Or if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, if you do subscribe, you'll get a notification when sure. we bring out our new videos week by week. Yep. And we'd love you to share it on social media. You can click the share button. It gives you the link. Yeah, preferred platform. And then if you'd like to comment on what we're speaking about or you've got some insight to share with us, that would be absolutely fantastic. Or you want to disagree. Or indeed, you want to disagree. Absolutely. Um, we, would, we would love to have some engagement and we have had some very good um, yeah. comments generally as well at, at, the, at the moment. So yeah, we yeah. have. We have some good discussion. Mm. Now, James, where have we got to in the lectionary year? Amazingly, we're already at Epiphany 3. Right. Uh, okay. So that's... Um, marching on and we're we're in year a so we're, we are in the gospel of matthew it is the gospel of matthew which means we have matthew chapter 4 and verses 12 to 23 which is the beginning of the public ministry of jesus and the call of the first disciples yeah. I, I suppose we we sort of have to gallop on into that it does feel as though having sort of just had mm. the birth of jesus and christmas and, <laughs> it does christmas feel and all that, it, it, you know we're in a we're in epiphany so but i i guess the the, the common theme is the progressive revelation of jesus, of jesus. To, yeah uh, those yeah. around him so. yeah and of course it's following matthew's um uh approach to this structurally i mean he moves quite quickly from birth of jesus to baptism of jesus to yes. call of, to jesus beginning of his ministry so yeah jumping over the silent years into which we only have one little window which is in luke and luke, the account yeah, with birth indeed jesus in the temple mm. um now uh i just need to make sure i've got my notes up in front of me that would really help wouldn't it um, so here we are, Matthew 4, verse 12. Now, just right at the very beginning, we've talked quite often in the past about comparing, particularly when we're looking at the synoptic Gospels, yeah. so the ones which um, look at it with one eye, as it were, syn yeah. together, synoptists, they look, they look at it together, of comparing um, Matthew's account here and just noting what Mark says, because there are yeah. both similarities and some contrasts as well. So yeah. sometimes we've sort of waved a synopsis in front of people and just plunging straight into the text. One of the things that I was very struck by, and in fact, if you do happen to read the Greek text, it's even more striking. But in English, now when he had heard that John, that is Jesus, yeah. that John had been arrested. Now, in Mark's gospel, it just simply says when John was arrested, Jesus withdrew or went to Galilee. And I was just very struck by the fact that the emphasis up front is Akusas, having heard that. John was being arrested. He withdrew. So yeah. it already, it seems to me, there's a distinctive sense here of the personal impact of that event on the ministry of Jesus. Yes, it, it does seem to be, doesn't it? And it, it feels as though this this hearing uh, is almost like a kind of trigger. It's almost an, it's a sign to Jesus that mm. his public ministry must now take place because he, you know, the time of John, essentially in terms of his public ministry, has come to an end. Mm. So, so now Jesus, is, this is the this is the this is the flag for Jesus to now now take take over really um, this this ministry, I suppose. And one of those intriguing things, which I don't think we've really got any answers to, and there's lots of speculation about, is the relationship between the ministry of John the Baptist and the John the Baptist sort of renewal movement as a whole, yeah. and then the ministry of Jesus and yes. Jesus's renewal movement. Because as we'll notice, I mean, I think we mentioned this before when we looked at the ministry of John the Baptist, his message. In Matthew's gospel is exactly the same as Jesus's. Repent yeah. for the kingdom of God is at hand. So Matthew yeah. is associating them very closely. But then on the other hand, we actually know from the fourth gospel, uh, the fourth gospel in um, John three and John four gives us a little window into suggesting that Jesus's ministry and John's were much more closely related than perhaps Luke and Mark suggest. Yeah, I think so. And and, and it, it, there is that sort of sense in John, isn't there? That almost Jesus is is part of the Johannine you know john the baptist's uh, movement yeah. um, and and then it, as a sense almost it, it kind of emerges from it and although the gospel is not mm. explicit in that it that's those are the ways it's kind of pushing us and hint, hinting to us mm. so, so but the, what what that tells us cer certainly is that there is significant continuity i think mm. um, as well as distinctiveness when jesus arrives yeah, uh, indeed. On, the, on the scene i was also quite interested in the verb here he withdrew into galilee mm. Um, and the reason is that's exactly the same word we had earlier for the action of Joseph with Mary. Yes. Um, and it always seems to signify um, a, a movement away from danger. So yeah. in Matthew 2.12, uh, being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, 
they departed or, or Joseph having been, that was a discontinuity there in the English translation, Joseph having been warned in a dream. Oh no, sorry. This is the, um, this is the, um, uh, Magi. The Magi were warned in a dream not to return to they, heaven. They, they, went, they withdrew from yes. another way, and then, yeah. uh, and then Joseph goes and takes the mother, uh, the mother and the child away to Egypt, and yeah. then they withdrew to um, the, the region of Galilee because of their fear of our Yes, yes. Judas. Yes. What, yeah, that's um, um, two twenty-two, I think. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's an interesting that Matthew is consistently using this language, so he's signalling, yeah, yeah, threat, movement, and so on. Yeah. But there's another really interesting movement in the next verse, isn't there? Jesus leaves Nazareth and goes to live in Capernaum. Yeah. Yeah. That, that does seem significant, doesn't it? Yeah. And I mean, Nazareth is quite a small um, town, isn't it? I mean, Capernaum is a much larger um, yeah. dwelling at this at this time. It's the opposite uh, of how it is today, of course, because now Nazareth is a big. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. And so, so in a sense, that's in terms of mission, that's logical, isn't it? That you go to the place where there's more interaction and then perhaps Capernaum, much more of a crossroads for, for Galilee, people coming and going, um, you know, tr with trade routes and so on. So, and there's two interesting things about that, I think, for me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one is that. Nazareth, it seems to me, in the first century is a bit of a mystery. Now, I don't know if any of our viewers have any insight on this and want to add some comment on mm. it. But one thing I have read, which I think is an interesting theory, is that Nazareth gets its name from the Netzer, which is the branch yes. uh, mentioned in Isaiah 11. So it was actually named after being a community of Messianic expectant Jews, yes. which would explain why Mary has this, who comes from Nazareth, has this extraordinary oh. sense of literacy and expectation. And that's why you the, yes, the, yes. The, the Magnificat is so well formed, as it were. She's been nurtured yes. in this sense of expectation of, of right. the Messiah coming. Um, and the other thing is that moving from Nazareth to Capernaum, he's moving, Jesus is moving from somewhere, a bit of a backwater to yeah. a major um center. Yeah. Where not only there's a big settlement, but also there's lots of traffic. Now, yeah. I, again, I've not seen this in commentaries, but it does seem to me that this is for, it's exactly the same kind of thing that Paul does in his missionary journeys. Yeah. Where yeah. he always goes to places which are significant crossroads or significant points of meeting and travel. Yeah. So that as the gospel is established there, then it, it's naturally carried out to other places. But yeah. that's just a kind of interesting observation. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it, that in the church today, I mean, so often that's 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 also the case. It's the it's it's the large centers, the, the metropolises that 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 actually um, you see these big movements yeah. uh, of yeah. the spirit of God. So and then and then the, and then that, that goes out, out from there to the ripples other, out. Yeah. To the, to the other areas, yeah. Yeah. And of course, we know that Capernaum is significant for a number of reasons. I mean, uh, later on um, in Matthew eight, we get mention of um, the soldier who Matthew describes yeah. as a centurion. Now, I, I mention him as a centurion. When we get to that passage, we might want to explore whether that really is a Roman soldier or not, or whether that's yeah. just a general term, but, but clearly a soldier of some rank and authority that would mm. probably be covering mm. a, a, a quite a large area. And then, of course, with the call of Levi, we know that um, this is a, there's a customs post here as well. So it's a, yeah. it's a tax point. It's a it's a boundary point as well. Yeah. So that, and, and that made me realize in this passage, there's actually quite a lot of language about crossing boundaries, which, again, I think we'll, we'll yeah. look at in a bit more detail. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I know you're very interested in this the description of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was actually the area, part of, part of the world that I lived in for my gap year. I went and worked in. Oh Kibbutz, right, yeah, Lower yeah. Galilee, and um, yeah. I used to yeah. get up early in the morning and watch the sunrise over Mount wow. Carmel. Very um, nice. Mm -hmm. And then Matthew, well, Matthew does an interesting thing. Matthew does what he always does, which is he he gets an Old Testament text. And then he shoehorns it yes. into the situation that's facing him. So he doesn't adapt his story to fit the text. He, he adapts the text to fit the story. And I know that you've noticed quite a few uh, bits of shoehorning there, haven't you? Yes, there is, there is, there is a bit of shoehorning. And, and, and also, I think the, I mean, it's very interesting how central the, an, the an idea of place is, isn't it? That, that mm. There's a particular, mm. the movement. I know it's symbolic, but it's, it's, Matthew also has this understanding that God is fulfilling his his movement in a particular time and particular yes. place, yes. and these places are important; they're not marginal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the 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 whole um, those verses fifteen and sixteen. Um, I mean, I think I'm particularly drawn to the to verse sixteen: the people who sat in darkness seen a great light; those who sat in the region of shadow of death, light has dawned. Yep. There's a um, whether whether it's significant or not. The the verbs in verse sixteen have been changed from those that are in oh. the Septuagint. Right, the Greek um, Old Testament, yeah, yeah, the Greek Old Testament. So, mm. um, 
and, and there's a slight i think the tenses have been changed as well slightly i think yes. you may mention this on the blog but there's this I sense do, yeah. in which matthew yeah. is saying this is fulfilled this is this has now happened happened in jesus yeah um and and therefore that is how we are to understand this text from now on is what matthew is essentially yeah. telling yeah. us yeah um He's also tweaked the first verse, 15, as well, because he's changed the language around. Because I think if you read the text in Isaiah, it suggests that we're talking about the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah, yeah. The and that you're, yeah. you're, as it were, you're in the West looking east. But actually, from the ministry of John the Baptist, if you then go across the Jordan, you're going from the east to the west. Yeah. And of course, he's mentioning the Sea of Galilee there as well. Now, mm. the Sea of Galilee isn't really a sea. And because Luke is very picky about titles, Luke consistently changes this to say it's the lake, yep. Galilee, the lake of Tiberias, because it isn't really a sea. But of yep. course, for, for Matthew, calling Galilee a sea, which was what actually it, what it would have been called uh, locally. But it, it means that this verse now fits very well because it's the way of the because Capernaum yeah. is now on the way Weird. of the sea. It's on the shore of Galilee as well. So. Yeah. And, and to be fair, it's a pretty big lake. I mean... <laughs> It is, yeah. It's not. It's not insignificant, is it? No, um, no that's true. It's probably no. bigger in their time than it is now. I don't know. But... It is. Yeah, the water level is shrinking. Mm. Um, one other thing which I thought was fascinating, and it really has occurred to me for the first time, just in preparing for our conversation, which is this: this language of those dwelling in the region of shadow of death on them a light has dawned. Mm. It just I suddenly realised that's almost exactly the same phrase that you get in Luke one seventy nine at the end of the Benedictus. Mm. Yes. So in the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from the high shall break upon those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death. Of death yeah. Um, and then, of course, you've got this fact, this, this language about place. So this is this is Galilee of the Gentiles. And again, we'll see evidence for particularly yeah. why that's important when we see the mm. look at the names of the, the first disciples. But uh, on the one hand, yes, there's a particular locality here, but there's a sense in which metaphorically this is the place we all dwell, is it not? We, we all yes. in our, our finitude, in our creatureness, we all dwell in the looming shadow of death as it were it yes. casts itself uh, before us because we are because we are mortal yes this is a way of saying everybody it's, it's not a way of yeah. it's not a way of pointing out a particular people who are in a particular situation yeah uh, yeah, uh, yeah. No, and no. Uh, and and it's fascinating too isn't it that this is galilee of the gentiles so what we have here is matthew is in a sense pointing out the mission of jesus as you say in the borders in the in yes. to the gen yeah. where, where there's gentiles and jews mixing yeah. Yeah. And yet, of course, later in the gospel, as we as we know, if you read Matthew, um, Jesus quite consistently says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And sometimes people say, oh, well, that meant, you know, that was that was the limit of, of the mission. But of course, it wasn't. It was yeah. right from the very beginning of Jesus ministry yeah. is the ultimate goal yes. in mind, which is the gospel to all the nations. Yeah. And you can't avoid that with, with the way Matthew presents it to us. Here. No, and it's, it is wonderful, though. I think that Matthew does come across as very particularly Jewish. Yes. And very ah. particular and very emphatically affirming the continuing validity of Torah, of the law. Mm. Yeah. And as you say, saying, you know, that, that Jesus has come only to the lost house of sheep of Israel. And yet you've actually got this little punctuation point. So the yes. Magi was one of them already. Yes, already. Yeah. And you've got this this language here as another little punctuation yeah. And then you've got the incident, for instance, with the Syrophoenician woman, but also yep. with the centurion as well. Both another two little punctuation points saying yeah. so so that when we get to Matthew 28 and the Great Commission. Yeah. It kind of Matthew smart. saying to us, well, well, I know I've been all Jewish all the way along, but come on, guys, you, you got this, didn't you, from the beginning? Yeah. It, yeah, it, was yeah. always, it was always going to end up here going beyond yeah. the, bound, the bounds of, yeah. of, of ethnic yeah. Israel. So. Yeah. 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 So, well, so it's one of those, one of those arguments very important to read, uh, you know, text in context and read the whole of the gospel. Yes. Um, and put it all together, which is what Matthew, as a as a you know as a teacher, in uh, it, that that's exactly how he would expect to understand a text. Yeah. You've got to deal with the whole thing. And it also comes back to the the thing we we explored last week as well, which is to say, there is quite a strong sense of the Gospels is that you're supposed to read them, and then having got to the end, you're supposed to go back and read them again. Read them again. Yeah. And then you, at the beginning, you say, ah, OK, great yeah. commission. Now I see the Mayweather Major. Oh, now I see Galilee of the Gentiles. Now yeah. I see the Centurion. So so you begin to spot those things which make bigger sense once you've seen the whole story. So, yeah, absolutely. Mm. OK, so we ought to keep reading them more than once. Then. That's good. We should. Mm. Um, well, that's the kind of first half. I mean, this reading is kind of a game in two halves, isn't it? So the first half is up to verse 16. And yeah. then we get a sort of change of focus. I think verse 17, or is verse 17 a hinge verse and then verse? verse yeah, 17. it's interesting how it's paragraphed in the various versions, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, NRSV puts it in the last verse of the first section and 
Yeah. I think the NIV puts it sort of somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, from that time, Jesus began to preach. I don't know whether that phrase is particularly significant. It, I mean, maybe that's just signaling the final as it break discontinuity with the ministry of, of, of John, John the Baptist. Yeah, so Jesus yeah. is Jesus is teaching. Um, I haven't got Mark in front of me, so I don't know whether that's different language from Mark. But um, Jesus began to preach, saying, "Now repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand." That's rather abbreviated, isn't it? In Mark, Jesus says the the, the the time has come the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god has come near yeah. repent and believe in the good news he says so he has a it is reconfigured isn't it yeah it's reconfigured i mean i think these these phases vary a little bit across the gospels but um they're summarizing something yeah. really important which of course is about eschatology it's about the um, immediacy of the uh, call of jesus yeah. it's 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 language it's a whole series of little phrases which yes. are all pointing to the same thing really yeah 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 no, <coughs> excuse me i think going down the wrong way just worth a little nod to our theological past a couple of generations ago there was a huge debate about the language of the kingdom of god at hand what did that mean did it mean it was about to come did it mean it was actually present and mm -hmm. i think out of that a general consensus now that what we might call partially realized eschatology or in more easier language the now and the net not yet of the kingdom yeah or i think some paraphrases say like this the kingdom of god is so close you can reach out and touch it ah yes yeah Quite a nice way of putting it mm. but mm. the key thing is that the the longed for just and peaceful rule of god is 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 coming close in the person and teaching of jesus himself oh, so yes. jesus continually yeah. associates the presence of the kingdom with his own teaching and ministry, which is yeah. interesting here, isn't it? And I think that's the thing you don't notice, particularly in the debates of the past, is that is that very close personal association of Jesus yeah. as as the yeah. embodiment of, of yeah. the kingdom. Yeah. Did you have to write a theological essay on what is the kingdom of God? I can't remember writing it, but I probably did. Oh yeah, um, I did too. I think it's somewhere on the blog somewhere. <laughs> oh, <is it? laughs> yeah. But there's an also a little interesting discussion, and this is kind of part of you know doing sort of undergraduate. Uh, New Testament Greek and things about the word repent because it's mm. one of these it's one of these common sort of sermon illustrations that repent the word for repent is metanoia which means think again yeah. so people say it's all about thinking again it's all about um, having a new understanding or new insight and that is really part of what we call the genetic fallacy which is that it's the it's based on the idea that words mean where they come from etymologically yeah, what they're rooted. and it's yeah. and that's actually not the case i no. think i must confess i think i have been guilty of actually saying that years and years ago mm. but i have i have repented you have repented <laughs> Indeed you have. <laughs> which means of course i mean as, as i think uh tom Wright points out in, in jesus and the victory of god that repentance means um turning turning around but yeah. simply following another way Changing, changing direction. Yes, I do one of my chapters, my, my booklet on uh, evangelical spirituality here, mm. uh, I argue that there are seven seven movements in the spiritual life. One of them is is ch turning, repenting, yeah. um, because it's equivalent to another another word, epistrepha, about turning, which yeah. is just, and it can mean literally, epistrepha can mean simply a change of direction. Physically, you're walking one way, then you turn and walk another. And this becomes a metaphor for a change of life. So, which is awkward, isn't it? That we, mm. we love, I mean, we want to we want to say Jesus accepts us as we are. Yeah. But it's interesting that the first thing that Jesus says here is don't carry on as you are. No. You need you need to change. You need yeah. to change direction. So, I always say to my my, my frog, you know, Jesus accepts us as we are, but he never leaves us as we are. No. That's a that's a that's a well worn phrase, isn't it? It is, and I do, I do think it's it's really really important to understand that because to be a Christian is to be changed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And transformed. Well, it's to be it's to be loved and change it's to be it's, it's, yeah. it's to receive the love of god and thereby be transformed so, yeah yeah absolutely as paul says in romans chapter 12 in view of the compassions of god yeah. offer your bodies living sacrifice being okay. transformed yeah. by the renewal yeah. of your mind yeah, and, yeah. yeah. okay fine yeah. um there's one or two other little tweaks about re repent i mean i know at one point <laughs> tom wright uses the language of repentance to make some connection with return from exile but i'm yeah. not sure i'm convinced by that yes he says that that sits in the background of the understanding that a first century jew would have had of what the word meant mm. um i'm not and I, I i'm not sure that they the sort of textual evidence is particularly yeah. 
no. wrong for that. But um, mm. who, who am I to argue with? Um... Well, I, I like the fact that John Barclay does comment about Tom Wright's theory about it's all about return from exile. And Tom, John Barclay says, yes, that's a wonderful explanation. The only problem with it is there's a zero, zero textual evidence for it. <laughs> Apart from that, it's it's terrific. It's nice, nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he begins his ministry. While he is walking by the Sea of Galilee, he sees two brothers, Simon. Now, here we go. He's anticipating the rest of it. Who is called Peter? Well, we Peter. know that now. He's later. <clears throat> and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. There's lots of lots of interesting stuff here. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about the names before, haven't we? We did. I think we talked about names last week with Simon and Andrew being uh, a, a Hebrew and a Greek name, um, uh, typical perhaps of that region, region being mixed, where, yeah. Very mixed region yeah and we are told in the fourth gospel that they both originally come from bethsaida yeah yeah now the key uh, thing is about bethsaida is it's across the the the, the river jordan therefore it's in a different territory tree. yeah so it's specifically more gentile under a different ruler so actually yeah. crossing over the, the jordan there you're crossing a boundary yeah but there's more yeah. boundary crossing there and they are amphiblestro they they are throwing a casting net into net. the sea yes now i'm really struck by this because i was recently went on a holiday in croatia and we had an evening meal uh, we were in um Dubrovnik, so on the sea and we had an evening meal and we were sitting uh, i will post this i'll post this picture up on the, the, the on the in, in the blog post and we were sitting and on the wall was an amphiblistron right was a casting what? net it was actually a pillar and these nets they are they're a round net and they've got little weights all around the edge. And what you do is you wade into the sea. You wait for the fish to come to you because they, they think you've got food or you put some food in. And then you throw this net and the, the, the weights carry the circle of the net over and you catch and you then haul it in and catch the fish. Yeah. yeah. Now, I know in Luke 5, there's a different sort of arrangement where you've got the same nets which are dropped and then they drift yeah. and then you gather them in. But I, I don't know. Is there something interesting, significant, symbolic of the fact that Jesus uses this as a, as a metaphor for... Yeah. Yeah. what what the ministry is going to be like is that they've got some food the fish come towards them they cast a net and they catch them and draw them in it's such yeah. a very dynamic kind very of dynamic yeah thing. yeah and I, I i do wonder you know why jesus chooses fishermen i mean it's not just a i can't believe it's just to fulfill the metaphor because clearly he chooses people who will be good at fishing for people and you do wonder what are the skills that a fisherman brings or or indeed the way of understanding yeah. life yeah that is yeah. embedded in being a fisherman yeah that helps them to understand how to share yeah. the gospel yeah. you know was it do they know where to are they good at reading the water um seeing yeah. where yeah. the fish will come patience uh, patience yeah absolutely yeah. perseverance and of course this is what we might call an artisan skill as well so these are these, yeah. are, these are working men these are men who yeah. run a business we know that actually yeah. um they are high, now does matthew tell us this that uh no mark tells us this actually eyewitness detail mark says in the parallel account that they leave the father with the hired men in the, men boat. In the boat so yeah. from mark we know that this is actually quite a big business yes. these are, these are well-off people they know what they, they know what they're doing um it means yeah. they know how to trade as well so they're used yeah. to sort of paying bills and negotiating and that kind of thing yeah so oh, they're, they're good at engaging with other cultures yeah uh, they are yeah. and they're, they're so, almost they're certainly polyglot so they'll yeah, be speaking with yeah. people traveling around, speaking different yeah. languages as well. Yeah, so, very interesting, isn't it? It is. It is. So they're kind of ideal evangelists, really. Yeah, they are. Mm. But of course, there's a whole mass. Now, I don't think we've got time to go into it. I put that on the blog. There's a whole mass of symbolism of fishing in the Old Testament. Yeah. Being. yeah. So the waters of the Gentiles, and then God is casting his fishing net, is casting judgment over the waters and drawing out those who yeah. are saved and, and, and separating, when you're separating the fish, separating those who are going to be saved from those who... Yeah those who, who face judgment i mean and jews were famously you know not very happy about the sea and which you know which is it's not a it's not a place they they relished uh mm -hmm. so they're often spoken of uh, is in terms of terror and fear and, yeah. and, and so yeah. on which is why the story of jonah is so remarkable that he's so desperate to run away from god he goes to the he sea, to sea. Yeah, boat. Yeah, um yeah and, and it's also worth us remembering that it's it's not uncommon in, in ancient cultures for people not to know how to swim. I mean, even now, for instance, in no. Africa, people don't know how to swim. So you, you see these terrible stories about on Lake Victoria, you see a boat capsized people. and everyone drowns. Yeah. And, and of course, that that would explain why even seasoned fishermen caught in a storm on, on the Sea of Galilee yeah. are terrified when the winds come up and the, and the boat's being swamped. You say, well, hey, guys, you know, you're fishermen, you can swim. But actually, not necessarily. No, that's fascinating, isn't it? If yeah. anybody has any information on first century competition swimming yeah. swimming i'd like you know but i, I, I think yes, it, swimming yeah, yeah it'd be really interesting yeah, wouldn't it yeah mm -hmm. yeah it would. a bit of research be done there
it is um i there's another little thing from um so a, a completely different source a bit left field this is um, mike higton who is professor yeah. of ministry training at durham university of durham mm. um he wrote a, a little grove booklet about higher education yeah and um he just actually draws on this passage and he, he makes some really fascinating observations about the personal journey for the disciples he says this jesus sees what the two men currently are and he calls them to a transformation to a strange fulfillment of what they are they are fishermen that is halies but he calls them to become fishermen that is halies anthropone fishers of mm. people fishers of mm. men there isn't actually the little English pun that we have. You don't go from fishermen to fishers of men. It's, it's, no, it's, it's a different no. phrase. Simon and Andrew respond by leaving what they are and beginning their journey towards this mysterious fulfillment, towards what they will be. They become, in that moment, disciples. They become learners. This is already clearly not about their desire to accumulate extra information or gain skills. It's about a deep remaking of who they are, a process that will engage with the selves they are now and will lead to a transfiguration of those selves that's yeah. just reflecting on that movement from being fishers to being fishers of men yeah and i, and yeah. I wonder if it also connects with what you said earlier about the fact that you know jesus just doesn't come and call us as we are but call uh, us. i think absolutely yeah. yeah i think i think it's exactly that isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then I, sorry yes go on so the other thing which is interesting because we then go on to call two more uh disciples who yeah. become the kind of core don't they of of, yeah. of particularly simon and james and john yeah. Um, but then, and, and yeah, so but they are the kind of core disciples that we call two more brothers. So we have two two sets of brothers who become yes. the first disciples, yes. which is yes, really isn't interesting. That striking yeah. um, that they know each other really, really well, which yes. must have been an advantage in this new new family, which I suppose is new mm. kinship, which Jesus is is developing. Yep. Um, but it also tells us something about potentially about the quality of the relationships in the new community that Jesus mm. is forming, mm. that, mm. that they are, we are to be like family with one another. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting that two sets of brothers are chosen, I think. It is. It yeah. is. The, the, the early Jesus movement was a family affair. Yeah. It was, in, really, in, yeah. In every, every sense of that word. Mm. I'm very intrigued. And again, I don't remember seeing this in any commentary. And again, if anyone wants to observe on this, I'm just always struck by the fact that Jesus saw James and John mending their nets. And he yeah. called, no, I, 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 I don't know what, if that means anything. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, there, it's, there in, it's there in Mark as well. Yeah. I mean, is it yeah. just because that's what they were doing? Yes. Or is, is it, it significant? It's their downtime, you know, because fishermen would normally fish at night and then they'd mend the nets in the day. Hey, yeah. Um, so maybe it's telling something there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Who there's knows? another whole big question which we haven't explored, which is the fact that Jesus, you know, calls them and immediately immediately they leave their nets so yeah, this is language yeah. we particularly find in mark's gospel but matthew yeah. includes it here as well we might be left with the impression that they've never heard of jesus before suddenly this stranger comes along and he's such a charismatic individual mm. they're kind of entranced mm. i just i just don't think that's true because i think no. you know again the first chapters of the fourth gospel say hey you know jesus was around they realized this you know john the baptist had made quite a stir maybe some of them had all been already been part of that as well so yeah but yeah. this this does seem to be a decisive moment here of when he says okay this thing's gathering momentum and now you're going to be part of it yeah. and in that sense it's anticipating i mean the actual naming of the 12 doesn't happen for a, for a good good few chapters later but this yeah. is the beginning this is the beginning to form this distinctive community isn't it yeah 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 absolutely yeah um, well, let's finish that. Our time's up. A little quotation at the end from Dick France's excellent commentary, the New International mm -hmm. Commentary. He says this, mm -hmm. from this point on, we shall not read stories about Jesus alone, which is interesting, in contrast with the fourth gospel. Yes. But stories about Jesus and his disciples. Wherever he goes, they will go. Their presence with Jesus, if not explicitly mentioned, is always assumed. While the 12 will not be formally named until Matthew 10, the stories from on, from here on in will assume a wider group of disciples than just these four. They will be the primary audience for his teaching and the witnesses of his works of power, but they are also called to be his active helpers in the task of fishing of people. Matthew's story is not only that of the Messiah, but also of the messianic community that is formed around him. Mm. Mm. And you and I are part of that today. Absolutely. Amazing, isn't it? It is. James, very good to talk with you. Friends, don't forget okay. to click on the like. Uh, subscribe, share, and uh, contrib contribute some comments. Mm. And we really look forward to seeing you uh, next time. Mm. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.